Life isn't always easy. In fact, sometimes it's really hard. Things might seem like they are coming at you from every angle. It might feel like you're not going to make it, but you've got to keep moving forward. There are good days and bad days. The bad days don't last forever. The good days will come again. There is a God who has destined you for breakthrough, for purpose, and for a life of impact. What you see in front of you is only temporary. God has good things in store for your future. In this life, you will have trials, but take heart, for Jesus has overcome the world. You have hope for tomorrow. God isn't mad at you. He's madly in love with you. Your life is not over. God is not done with you. If you're breathing, there is hope. Actress Anne Hathaway has this to say about loneliness. Loneliness is my least favorite thing about life. The thing that I'm most worried about is just being alone without anybody to care for or someone who will care for me. I think most of us would agree to some degree with Anne Hathaway, and I hasten to point out she's a movie star, so more than likely she has an entourage of people around her all the time. But nevertheless, she has this deep, deep fear and concern about being alone. And I think that's in part because God created us to connect with one another. He created us as relational beings. So he's designed us to need connection with other human beings. But loneliness, I think loneliness is something that we all experience at different times in different ways. For example, there's a loneliness we can feel when we long to be in a special relationship with someone. Singles sometimes feel this loneliness. A while back, a single gal that I know came to me and she was really of heavy heart. Her aging mother, uh, had fallen ill and was in a very difficult situation. The single gal helped her. And uh, then she went home. And as she walked into her home, she realized she was alone. And there was no one there to put their arms around her to give her strength. That's a, that's a kind of loneliness. There's also loneliness of being uh, in the midst of a crowd and feeling lonely. I've experienced that. Maybe you have as well. There were short seasons in our previous ministry at Summit, which uh, most of you know was a, was a large church, but there were, there were seasons where, where Pam uh, would tell me that the loneliest time of her week was in church. Now, there were a couple thousand people there, and we started the church. She knew almost everybody. But in spite of that, sometimes you can be in a crowd and feel very, very lonely. Another kind of loneliness happens when you've been in a rela relationship for a long time and, and it suddenly ends. And there have been seasons in my ministry when, for some reason, uh, several uh, spouses die in, in a string. And uh, I'm, I, I do the funerals. And, and I've, I've heard many, many times in those seasons comments like this. We were together for such a long time, it feels like an arm was cut off. Uh, everything is different now. I feel so alone. When you've been in a long relationship and suddenly that ends, there's a kind of loneliness that brings ache to the soul. There's at least one other kind of loneliness. That happens when we make a major move, like changing countries or changing cities or changing schools. I think this may be a kind of loneliness that uh, is very, very common in Costa Rica because uh, many of us have come from other places and we're uprooted and we don't have a relational network around us. Uh, these kinds of changes, when they happen in our lives, they, they leave us uh, cut off from the relational web that used to hold us closely. My dad was in the military when I was younger and, and we moved every two years. And I still have memories. We moved in the summer. My birthday was in August, and I have memories of many birthday parties where I had no children, no friends, because school hadn't started. That happened in September, and so I had birthday parties with my family and no friends. There's a kind of loneliness. Loneliness comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. 
And I'm guessing in our room today that many of us have experienced one or another kind of loneliness. Mother Teresa said, the most terrible poverty is loneliness. Oh, I think that's brilliant. The most terrible poverty is loneliness. But it's an experience that we all face. So this is the third week in our series. If you're still breathing, there's hope. We're talking about some of the difficult chapters in life and learn how we can lean into God's grace in those chapters so that uh, we can experience greater levels of victory and not be hopeless. Today we consider when you feel alone, when you feel alone. And to do this, I'd like you to either open your Bible or take your sermon notes, the message notes from the seat that you're on. And we're going to turn to a passage in the Old Testament book of Ruth. Now, Ruth is a beautiful love story. Many of us are familiar with the story, but it's also a story that begins with pain, loss, and loneliness. So I think we can all learn some very important things from this story today. Now, in addition to discovering some principles that will help us deal with loneliness, I also want us to to learn here by this example how we can glean uh, spiritual nuggets from narrative portions of Scripture. Now, narrative portions of Scripture are the stories that are told in the Bible. And much of the Bible is told in narrative form. For example, First and Second Samuel, they tell the story of a history of various kings of Israel. But if we only see history in these narrative sections, we're going to miss a great deal of what God wants to teach us. We find this in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4. For everything that was written in the past... It was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. We might have hope. So everything in the Old Testament scriptures, including the narrative portions, is written so that we might have hope. They're not teaching simply history. God wants us to have hope by applying the spiritual principles that are embedded in these portions of the Bible. But to uncover these nuggets of gold... We need to read the scriptures slowly, carefully, and leaning into the Holy Spirit. And that's what I want to do today with this portion of Ruth. Ruth is more than just a love story that teaches about uh, the lineage of Jesus Christ. It certainly does that, but it teaches us some important principles about dealing with pain and loneliness. So let's dive in. Chapter 1 in uh, Ruth begins with a focus on a woman called Naomi. She's married to a man called Elimelech, and they had two sons. There's a famine in Israel, so they flee Israel and go to a place called Moab. While in Moab, Elimelech dies. Now, the death of a husband is always very painful, I'm sure. Emotional loss. But in that culture, at that time, it it very well could have spelled uh, financial disaster for Naomi. You see... For the most part, women at that period of time didn't work outside the home, so they were completely dependent on their husband for their food and shelter. So Elimelech's death put Naomi in a very precarious position. Now, this was compounded by the fact that Naomi was living in Moab. Had she still been in Israel, she would have perhaps had extended family to lend a hand, but because she was a long way from Israel, she didn't have anybody to lean on, and but somehow... Uh, she keeps going, and by and by her two sons marry two Moabite women. One was named Orpah, and the name was, other was named Ruth. But after 10 years, disaster strikes again, and now her two sons die. So once again, she's faced with enormous loss and loneliness. Uh, Pam and I have been parents now for over 40 years, and, and I have seen how a mother's heart is uh, continually woven into the lives and hearts of her children, no matter how old they are. And I can just imagine Naomi feeling this loss of her sons, even though they were married, the loss of hearing them talk about their exploits, the loss of the camaraderie over a meal. Now, at this point, uh, after the loss of her two sons, Naomi hears that the famine in Israel is, is over. So there's food back in Israel. So she decides to move back to Israel. And at first, her two daughters-in-law plan to go with her. But Naomi releases those two daughters so that they can marry again in Moab. One of them decides to stay. That's Orpah. And Ruth decides to go with uh, 
uh, Naomi back to Israel. And what Ruth tells Naomi is often read in weddings. It's a beautiful statement. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Now keep in mind that Ruth was a widow also at that time. She'd lost her husband as well. And so both of these women had lost, uh, had this deep, painful loss. And this is where we pick up the story, chapter 1, verse 19. You can follow along on your sermon notes. So the, two men, so the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Now from this passage, I want us to glean three choices that you can make, three choices that I can make that will help keep hope alive when we feel lonely. I, I want you to understand, uh, long, the, these choices won't necessarily eliminate loneliness. That's not the focus of the passage in Ruth. I'm not talking about how to make new friends. There's other portions of Scripture that might talk about those issues. But what we're going to learn in this passage is how to keep uh, sinking into a pit of despair when we experience seasons of loneliness. And I said earlier, we all pass through times like this. So the next time we're sensing loneliness begin to crush us and down. These are choices, front brain choices that we can make that will help us from going down that pit of despair. We may not feel lonely every day, but I'm certain at some points, here and there we will experience loneliness. So the first choice is this, believe that you're God's special possession. Believe that you are God's special possession. Now unfortunately, this is exactly the opposite of what he does. She was so overcome with her pain that she allowed that pain to define her life. We see this in verse 20. Don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant in Hebrew. Call me Mara instead, which means bitter. And then she goes into a rant uh, about how God had made her life miserable. She says she went away full and now she's, she's coming back empty. Now this can happen to any of us if, if we Become consumed with with love. careful, we can begin to let it define who we are as a human being. And when the, we do when we do this, it begins to distort our perspective, and we begin to see things in ways that are really not accurate at all. For example, Naomi fled Israel to Moab because there was a famine. I mean, life was difficult. In Israel. Back in that day, to move from one country to the next, it wasn't like you would, you know, rent a U Haul van or call beacons and come have them pack you up and move you. I mean, it was tough sledding to move from one country to the next. They really wanted to get out of Dodge. Life was not good in Israel when they left. So, this kind of distortion of our perspective can begin to happen when we go through difficulties. Loneliness, we can let it become all-consuming. Essentially, it takes over our life. We be, that's all we think about, and, and it begins to just consume us. So it's not just a lonely season that we're going through. This is who we are. I'm a lonely person, and I'm always going to be a lonely person. We see this in, in Naomi when, when she changes her name. She says, this is who I am from now on. Mara, I'm bitter. It's never going to change. My life used to be pleasant. That's distortion of perspective. And now it's terrible and it's always going to be ter terrible. Now, when we let our mind go down that path, it sucks all the joy and hope out of our life. Instead of let our, letting our pain define us, God wants us to remember, all of us here today, that we are His special possession. Yes, we may feel lonely, 
That's not who we are. Who we are. We're, we're a child of God if we've trusted in Christ as our Lord. Yes, it hurts. Loneliness hurts. But it's not, it doesn't define our lives. It doesn't, it's not who we are. It's just what we're experiencing. So we, we allow God to define who we are. And I love how this is described in Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 17. I love this text. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will rejoice over you with singing. He will quiet you with his love. It's just a beautiful, beautiful text. Think about this. He will rejoice over you with singing. So when I was, uh, uh, I have four kids. When they were little in the crib, I would stand over the crib, all four, and I would sing. I don't sing well, but, you know, they didn't mind. I was dead. So I would sing over them. And that's the picture that this scripture is giving to us, that God is singing over you with his love. That's what he thinks about you. I love how Lucho says it. He likes you. God likes you. Warts and all. He's singing over you. And I also love the way this is described in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. This is who we are. These scriptures teach us who we are. Say, but we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. That's what the Bible tells us, God's inspired word of God. That's who we are, God's special possession. That's who we are. In fact, I'd like you to say that with me. I am God's special possession. Would you say that with me? Come on now. I am God's special possession. Okay, that was a little... Okay, now let's do it with some gusto, okay? You all had breakfast. I am God's special possession. Now, there have been seasons in our lives, my Pam and I, when there have been a fairly long lists of people that have disappointed us. And during those seasons, it seemed that every time uh, we got hit by some other disappointment, one after another, and in, in those seasons... It was easy for us to maybe slip into a place like Naomi to begin thinking, well, this is, this is what we are. We're, we're just beat up people. And I tell you, that takes the hope right out of your heart and soul. But then every time that's happened, uh, we have this powerful sort of re-encounter with God. And, and we sort of wake up from our little pity party and we remember who we are that we're loved and treasured, and we also remember who God is. I mean, God is spectacular. God is sovereign, immovable, perfect, holy, all-powerful, glorious, majestic, faithful, good, wonderful, loving, gracious, redemptive, and I could go on and on. That's who God is. And and when our eyes are lifted up and we remember who God is and who we are, his special possession, boy, that's a game changer, friends. So how do you keep hope alive when you're feeling alone? Well, the first thing you can do is choose to believe. Front brain, I am something special to God. Say it again with me one more time, okay? I am God's special possession. Second choice you can make. And believe me, these are choices that we have to make. It's not going to happen automatically. You have to front brain it. Choose. Second choice. Focus on the blessings you do have. Focus on the blessings that you do have. Getting back to the book of Ruth, it's, it's ironic that in Naomi's pain, she, she missed seeing the incredible blessing that was walking right beside her. And I'm talking about Ruth was right next to her. So if you, if you read the rest of the book of Ruth, you find out that Ruth was the doorway for Naomi to have a whole other family. And, and yet Naomi was so consumed with what she didn't have, she failed to see what she did have. Remember that as she, she had lost uh, her husband and both of her sons in Moab, 
But at the end of the story, in Ruth chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. Now, that was Ruth's baby. So this is a beautiful little twist in the story. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. Basically, now she has another son. The women there living there said, Naomi has a son. So it's, Ruth was a doorway for Naomi to have a whole other family and to experience the joy that, uh, that now beyond the loss that she had experienced. This means that in a sense, she's given this brand new family in her old age. The new son replaced the two sons that had died. Ruth was an amazing blessing for Naomi. But as they walked into Bethlehem, Naomi didn't see any of that. She overlooked it. Remember what she said? Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. So she missed seeing the blessing walking next to her, and that sucked all the hope out of her soul. So if you want to keep hope alive when you're in a season of loneliness, focus on the blessings that you do have. Focus on the blessings you do have. You may feel lonely, but do you have good health? Thank God for it. You may long to have a companion in life, and it hurts, yes. But do you have a job and food and a vehicle? Thank God for those things. Yes, it may feel like you have an arm cut off if you have a, a spouse or a long-term relationship that's passed away. But do you still have other friends around you? Thank God for those friends. Thank God for what we do have in the midst of these seasons. Now, there's an old song that uh, we have been singing here and there here at, at ECF that I think is beautiful. Open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. That's really what I'm talking about. God, open my heart to see the blessings that I have around me and not just focus on what I don't have. And friends, this, this is a choice we have to make. It's not going to happen automatically because the flesh will drag us down to want to wallow in our, in our pain and, and get all consumed in our pain. But friends, if we can, we can choose to focus on the blessings and the one way I walk this out in my life, and I've done this for uh, several decades now, I have a prayer journal that I use, and I've used this same pattern for 30 plus years now. And when I begin my prayer time, I have a notebook size page where I write down what I'm thankful for. I write it down. Now, I may feel lonely, I may feel discouraged. I may feel, I don't know, blue, bile rhythms, who knows? But when I'm writing down those blessings, something transformational hap happens in me. So I, I, I write them down. God, I thank you for my health. I thank you for my home. I thank you for provision. I thank you for, here in Costa Rica, I'm all, I thank you for the flowers. I thank you for, I'm in shorts. The only time in the week I wear pants is at church. I mean, this is an amazing place, guys. Those of you who lived here for a long time, you might not appreciate it, but in other places, there's something called snow, and you have to wear clothes, you know, like, like lots of clothes. It's an amazing place. So I'm in my backyard, and I'm thanking God for the birds. I wake up not with an alarm clock here in this place. I wake up to birds. I mean, they just cheer me up, and I go, wow, I'm awake, you know, and it's five in the morning. It's just amazing. I love it. So thank God for what you do have, and I, I have the discipline of writing these things down every day when I have my prayer time, and it, it, I don't know exactly how it works. I really don't, but something supernatural happens when I begin to praise God, and it reminds me of a story in 2 Chronicles 20. There was a vast enemy bearing down on Israel. Israel was so outnumbered, there wasn't a, there wasn't a chance that they were going to win in, in this battle. And so King Jehoshaphat calls God's people together, and they fast and pray. You know, as a family, church family here, we're fasting on the first Wednesday of every month, so we're following this pattern. We're fasting and praying. Well, they were fasting and praying, and then verse 21, it says, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise Him for the splendor of His holiness as they went out at the head of the army. So the, the prayer team, it's Lucio and Regina and Debbie out in front of the army. They're leading this praise 
team, the army's following, then saying, giving thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. So as that worship team went out ahead of the, the vast army, God worked in a miraculous way, and without raising a bow or an arrow or a sword, the enemy was defeated. And again, I don't know exactly how this all works. But I think there's a connection with praising God and releasing spiritual power. Again, I can't explain it exactly, but that appears to be what happens here is they march out, they're praising God, and God moves. And uh, somehow it releases the power of God. And it certainly lifts us emotionally if we begin focusing on what we do have, praising God for all of His blessings, even in the midst of of the pain that we're experiencing. Do you remember the attributes of God that I just mentioned? There are many others we could mention. When I'm praising God, I, I remember these attributes. In fact, I, I'd like us to say them together, okay? I think this is this beautiful. This is who God is, okay? God is, say it with me, sovereign, immovable, perfect, holy, all-powerful, glorious, majestic, Faithful, good, wonderful, loving, gracious, redemptive. That's who God is. And when we remember He's all those things, okay, I'm lonely and I hurt. But God, thank you. Thank you that you are who you are. So how do you keep hope alive when you're going through a season of loneliness? Well, number one, you choose to believe that you are God's special possession. You may feel lonely, but that's not who you are. Who are you? Say it again with me. I am God's special possession. One more time. I am God's special possession. And number two, choose to focus on the blessings that you do have. Naomi was standing right next to the greatest blessing in her life, and that was, that was Ruth. But she didn't see it because she was so focused on her own pain. Don't let that happen to you. Count your blessings. There's an old hymn. Name them one by one. Spell them out if you need to. That's certainly helped me in my spiritual journey. Now, there's one more choice you can make that will help keep hope alive. Remember that God is still in control. Remember that God is still in control. Now, there's a, there's a, a phrase back in verse 22 at the very end of the passage that we read that is pregnant with significance and spiritual application. This is, this is an example of, of a spiritual nugget that you can miss if you don't read the scriptures carefully, leaning into the Holy Spirit. That phrase is, they, they were arriving in Jerusalem just as the barley harvest was beginning. They were arriving back in Bethlehem just as the barley harvest was beginning. Now, why is that significant? Because as you read the story, you, found out, you find out that because the barley harvest was happening, Ruth found a job gleaning in the fields. Because she found a job gleaning in the fields, she met Boaz. Because she met Boaz, she had a husband. Because she had a husband, she had a baby named Obed who could become the father of Jesse. And because Jesse was born, he could have a baby named David who would grow up to become the greatest king in Israel's history and a direct descendant of the king of kings himself. And all that happened because Naomi and Ruth were arriving in Bethlehem right as the barley harvest was taking place. God arranged in his sovereignty, this perfect sequence of timing because God is ultimately in control, friends. And it will take a whole lot of weight off our shoulders if we let God be God and not try to carry that on our shoulders. Too often, and I know from personal experience, too often we try to fix things in our lives like loneliness by forcing things to happen. But I have a little secret to share with you this morning. I discovered I make a terrible God. <laughs> and you do too. Let God 
be God. It's God's business to keep the world spinning at a thousand miles an hour. He's God. Let Him be God. So the next time you feel lonely, remember that God is He's sovereign. He's still in control. Relax and trust Him. Yes, it hurts. God, I know you're bigger. And I'm going to trust you. Don't try to force things by manipulating or contriving. Just let him be God. Just keep doing the right things and let God be God. The Lord changed Naomi and Ruth's circumstances really rather quickly. He's done that throughout history. I mean, he can turn corners very, very quickly. Your circumstance may seem like there's no end in sight. And who knows, but just around the corner, he might have something that he's going to do. We don't know. But we need to trust him, friends. God is still in control. Now, there's one more thing that I want to point out that will help us in these seasons of loneliness. It's not directly found in this passage, but it's repeated many times throughout the scriptures. Even though we may feel lonely, if we're a Christ follower, God is still with us. And that, my friends, is beautiful. He's with us. We may not have the companion physically next to us that we long for, but if we, we're a child of God, the Lord is with us. And so we might feel lonely from a human perspective. God assures us that if we're part of his family, we're never completely alone. This is one of the last promises that Jesus made before he ascended back to the Father. And it's a beautiful promise. It's in Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. If we're a child of God by faith in Christ, He is with us always. Let that sink in your soul for a moment. In the middle of the night, if you wake up, as I'm sometimes prone to do, and your mind begins to wander, remember that you're not alone. He's there with you in that very moment. If you're coming into church and you're feeling a little awkward because you're coming by yourself and you're not sure if you're going to have somebody to sit by, just remember, if you're a child of God, you're not alone. He's right there with you. He wants us to know that. He's with us always to the very end of the age. These are choices that we can make, friends. And allow this to sort of sink in as we kind of wrap up this morning. Uh, I want us to repeat the memory verse that we're focusing on this series. It's from Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 is a beautiful passage. We spoke on it a few weeks ago. And this, this scripture memory verse is one that often comes to my mind in the middle of the night. Uh, I hope as you commit it to memory and let it soak into your soul, it'll come uh, back into your memory as well. And there's more memory cards back on the table if you want to get one on your way out. Did you say it with me? He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the... Okay, hold on, hold on. Hold on. So my, my wife Pam was coaching me on this. She said, when we do this, everybody gets off sync. He, she says, he says, Steve, you need to be slower. So I need to be slower. So I'm going to turn around, and we're going to say it and try to be in a core saying it together, okay? Let's try it, and I'll try to go slow, and so we can let the words sink in, okay? Let's do it together. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk, not be faint. Isaiah 40, 29 to 31. Back. Father, I want to thank you. It's been beautiful to have such attentive people listening today. Father, I, I'm guessing that my, some of us, maybe many of us, really do str struggle with loneliness. Father, would you take these principles and etch them into our souls? 
we choose to live above our circumstances, that we would be hope-filled people. Because as sure enough, if we're still breathing, we have hope, especially leaning into Jesus. I pray in his name, amen.